Uh, my name is Henrik, like uh, stated, and uh, I work for Nero in Stockholm. And uh, this is uh, a, a tale of two systems, basically. The first with a problem, and the second one is a natural evolution of that thing. Uh, the first system didn't at all use uh, Scylla in any way. Um, uh, most of us in, in our company hadn't even heard of it. So the, the initial system uh, was a fairly standard uh, microservice-based pipeline of actions working on uh, a stream of messages continuously flowing through. An additional complexity to this was that uh, there was this concept of a batch, and essentially it was uh, over a time frame, uh, things that happened there was deemed to belong together. So, sort of a batch. Uh, that batch had to be maintained across the cluster, of course, and it given microservice in the stream needed to be able to determine which batch a message uh, belongs to and or collect all messages belonging to the said batch. And this around here is where the problem starts to crop up, as we will see later on. So this is the conceptual image of, I have one of these, right? Yeah, oh. The conceptual uh, 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 architecture of the system. Signals go, uh, flow through ca Kafka, notifying each service that the upstream service has produced something that you might be interested in. And by automatic uh, uh, storage into Elastic, uh, there was a little wrapper code around here that always stored things into Elastic and uh, read and serialized them, uh, materialized them on the, on the receiving end automatically. So this happened all the time in Elastic. And uh, the signals uh, notifying downstream that something has happened went into Kafka. Fairly uh, similar. And there, there was, of course, uh, a lot of custom actions happening within those microservices, but that was the general, uh, general idea. So this batch orientation, what, what does that entail really? It's just a simple mapping between a, a message and its corresponding batch. Sounds simple enough, right? And conceptually, it is really simple. It's as simple as it sounds. So uh, how did we do this? Uh, we used, of course, Redis, because that's what it does. Uh, it's really fast at these things, and you can also, with some effort, reassemble series of these mappings, as we will see, uh, which usually also happened uh, as a conceptual end state, like you do on the leftmost side, you, do, you input a lot of things, and it happens. Uh, transforms, modifies, stores messages to other uh, systems, etc. And on the end, end state service, so to speak, uh, usually an assembly of these messages in, in that batch happened. Still, not very hard. Conceptually, very easy. So, what, what happened then is that in, to implement this in, in Redis, uh, there are basically two, two ways. Uh, Redis has its um, uh, data structures. It has a fairly rich set of data structures. One of them is lists, right? It has other things like sorted sets, which are nice, really cool. But they are separate from this mapping into the... Uh, we have a huge set of mappings from a message to a batch, et cetera, et cetera. Go, so on and so forth, a lot of these mappings they are kept separate from these lists, who is another structure in Redis. And we did not want this, this uh, uh, disconnect. Uh, like uh, it's, it's like having two, two stores, basically. Uh, in retrospect, perhaps it would have been better, as we shall see. So instead, we use this scan command that Redis exposes in its API. And, and that's a simple iteration, cursor-based iteration. You start from usually zero to thousands, say, or some number n uh, that is suitable for you, and you just read all of those. Then you say, give me from 1,000 to maybe 2,000, etc., etc., so on and so forth. That, uh, that worked, at least, and it's the process that we chose. Uh, at this point, stuff within Redis uh, started to make itself known, and, and uh, 
uh, we had this uh, interesting discussion on lunch on, on, on how uh, separation of concerns and layerings and uh, uh, these nice uh, uh, CS concepts that we are taught and uh, teach others all the time start to break down actually. Uh, what, what happens is uh, lies somewhere here, secret is there. This scan method blocks, uh, it turns out. So while I'm reading this batch of batches, so to speak, from Redis, my first thousand, uh, uh, the server blocks, basically. And it's not like you have your application level thread in, in Java, for example, and you have some lock, and while I'm holding this lock, no other thread can do something. This is server-wide. You have a static block somewhere that nothing can penetrate. So uh, uh, while, while we're doing this, and there are many ways to do this. I can choose 10 at a time, giving, giving the clients, the other clients doing inserts and updates and deletes, et cetera, whatnot, giving them a chance to, um, to do some work while I'm uh, fetching my small batches. But that means I will have to uh, potentially do a lot of fetching of these things. Like, or the other way around, I fetch this many. This is, this is a lot, by the way. So uh, I fetch a million at a time. So uh, which means that I don't have to do that many, che that many fetches, but they take uh, quite some time uh, each time, during which time no one else can do anything. So, oh yeah, we got into this. So what happens then in a, in a millions or even many millions batch? Everything grinds to a halt. It's, you know, and nothing shows up because that thing is, from the application point of view, nothing happens. So there is, oh, what's happening? It's not working, it's not doing anything. In fact, it should be really fast because it's in Redis. So uh, we are being uh, perplexed, to say the least, until we realize this, of course, that Redis's very nature is single-threaded. <laughs> And it really blocks, and it blocks very hard, and we feel like this. It's, it's um, of course, very easy to make a cheap pun and fun of, of Redis when it's not Redis's fault. It's actually our fault. We should have known this. And uh, <laughs> in retrospect, in our retrospectives, it, we even found out that, yeah, we did know this. Why didn't we think of it? We have no idea. You should ask some agile coach about that. So uh, we decided at least to, uh, since hindsight is 2020, uh, we'll do better next time. Let's hope that's the case. So uh, how, do we, how did we solve this then? It, the discussion, it sounds like it went on for days and it didn't. It took an afternoon and we decided and uh, uh, thought a little bit more about it. What is this really? It's a relation, like you have one too many, right? You have a batch and you have many messages. Uh, what's happening here? Can it be like, are we back here? So perhaps we're back in SQL land. Why not? We ask ourselves, we have to do due diligence because we didn't do it last time. Okay, uh, we all have uh, our, uh, uh, we've seen before uh, in talks earlier today how people go through, uh, jump through hoops to, to scale uh, uh, databases like Postgres and even Mongo, these things that are touted as, as uh, very good software otherwise, which they are. We, we actually love, love these tools. We have a lot of experience within the team and within the company using both Postgres and MongoDB. They are good stuff and they uh, excel at different things, of course, uh, but what they both have in common, in my experience, is at least like uh, scalability uh, in the Postgres case is very complicated. And you have this uh, write master read slave setup where, where uh, uh, you replicate the wall and, and everything in, is nice and dandy and you can read really fast from the, from the slaves. Problem is here, we have so many writes, right? What happens then? We're gonna, for each write, we're gonna replicate that thing over to the other nodes and we're gonna often query completely directly, which means that most likely the, the uh, last written thing will not be available on the, on the read slaves, which means in turn that we, we were gonna have to query the write master. And then we're back in basically in single node land. Uh, not good. So we thought, what about Mongo? It has sharding, but 
we just stared at each other and said, no, let's not do that. Because no, we had tried, and several of members in, in our adjacent teams had tried this before, and they said, like, don't do it. That, that's the only thing they said, and then they just walked away. So, <laughs> so don't do it. And that's sad, because sharding is how you scale things properly, right? It's, you, you don't try to share as much. You, you try to not share, and sharding is basically not sharing. So, so uh, oh, we go back and forth, and we start uh, thinking about weird stuff, like how hard can it be to implement this thing in memory, like in our own app? Like, not, not hard at all, right? But then we remember, no, don't do it. So, because we're basically in the same situation, like Scylla people, when they implement uh, clustering, like they work really, really hard on making data available everywhere. And we would have to do this for, for what? For this little thing, right? No way. So, uh, and we go back and forth on various other NoSQL solutions, none of which we were really comfortable with. The low level stuff like level DB or LMDB would uh, be really fast, but they would have the same thing as the custom app problem. If you don't <laughs> share the data, uh, or at least share knowledge of when data changes, uh, they will become out of sync, unless we run one node, of course, which is more or less what we did with the Redis instance anyway. But uh, we didn't want to go there again. A and higher level stuff like React, no one knew anything much about them. They might have worked as well. So, enter Scylla. And I basically had heard about it since uh, before uh, 1.0. There was uh, blog posts about sleeping good on Black Friday, stuff like that. Uh, and I had uh, done some Cassandra stuff before, so I liked, uh, I liked that stuff. And CQL is almost uh, SQL, so you can relate to how to ask for things from this, uh, this storage. Uh, and uh, uh, we had some, I had some notable uh, memory of people from, from lurking on the kernel list. And if nothing else, if you never ever use Scylla DB, take a look at least in the commit logs because that thing is amazing. Uh, and so we did that at least after some uh, grumbling from, from operations. Uh, they had never heard of, of this uh, new thing and uh, they were trying to uh, get out of it any way possible, but I said no. And eventually we got those instances and Luckily, our abstractions in our, our own code wasn't that uh, complicated. So we could just fairly easily re-implement uh, this little class. In this case, it was a Java-based application um, to just use ScyllaDB instead. And uh, what happened, uh, the uh, only thing uh, we actually had problems was, was not in the implementation. Like writing CQL is pretty easy and uh, uh, serializing things to and from the database. Uh, what, what do we have here? Like string, string, pairs, things. Not hard at all. So, uh, so the only thing we had a little bit of problem with was the imaging images. Uh, our Red Hat images were not uh, really compatible with the uh, Scylla install scripts. That has probably been easier and we're working with uh, our operations to make that work even better. Uh, so, performance-wise, uh, so lookups and inserts uh, compared with Redis were negligible. In we did some initial benchmarking using uh, on our own API using uh, VRQ, w, uh, VRK, uh, and uh, showed no regression at all, uh, at least no significant regression. And uh, listings, though, which was why we did this. Uh, the problem of locking, blocking, uh, latency when, when listing things that belong together, these batches, were all gone. So um, that was uh, uh, now uh, more of a problem of marshalling things really fast. So, and, uh, and this thing, oh, so nice. Just don't have to do much operation maintenance. A clear, uh, clear win. We were not happy with this system, however, so we took it a little bit further. And uh, when I say took it a little bit further, that's really funny because it was a complete rewrite. So, uh, <laughs> but it it had uh, it had uh, 
the basic structure in, in common, like you uh, send the messages uh, in a pipeline or a graph more or less. Uh, one message could go to many, many downstream consumers. Uh, and uh, these things do what they do and pass it on to the next whomever may be interested, I don't really care kind of fashion. And this time stuff flowed through NATS instead and each uh, uh, service stored their own inputs, outputs as necessary. Uh, there was no automatic serialization into Elastic or anything like that. Uh, and the batch, the whole batch concept, the previous bug, totally gone because no more batch concept. So uh, what do we do? Uh, what do we use Scylla for then? Uh, basically, all other storage. Uh, and uh, this is a new conceptual uh, structure. It's simplified, but. Basically, this is uh, how it works. You have the back plane where stuff flows and receivers and producer consumers and they store whenever necessary uh, their data and their events, their logs, etc., into Scylla. Uh, that's uh, also very simple setup. The, these, all of them basically had APIs as well, like REST APIs up here, but never mind. So what we store? Basically, uh, the most the, the thing that we uh, foresee will take up most storage is actually uh, diagnostic in nature, like what events happen in within the flow that might be of interest, and um, that that could be, for example, a payload is rejected for some weird reason. Maybe some data in the payload is so important that it has to be there, but it's no longer there. I cannot emit this data to the ne to the uh, next consumer. Uh, when someone fixes the data, uh, it, it uh, keeps track of this and also logs that, oh, now this one is live again. It's going to go out. Uh, and these storages uh, also are also exposed uh, via REST uh, so that we can query what's in, it, what's in them and what's not in them, etc. Uh, and there is no end to the possibilities here of what, what we might want to store. We're just storing low-hanging fruit at the moment, but still it's historical data in nature, so sometimes it can be between 10 and 50 of these per item in the database, which makes it, well, I don't know, billions, a lot. And then we store actual data. What is actual data? That's uh, uh, basically uh, everything that we send in the messages. <laughs> That, that might sound uh, weird, but, uh, but yeah, it's everything. And when, when a certain service decides that it's, uh, for example, too costly to produce this data, it can interact perhaps with 10 other microservices during its, its own operation. Uh, and uh, doing that all over uh, when it's unnecessary is just uh, wasteful. It also enables stuff like from these points on, we can have replay functionality. It's just take the output of this service, uh, what all it has, and just stream them on downstream and uh, uh, see what happens. Perhaps there was a bug in the downstream service. We can easily just shuffle that thing from, from a certain point in time. Uh, we have some arcane outputs of these files. That's uh, really high-tech stuff. So, uh, but these are very easily generated directly from Scylla. No, virtually no code, I would say because we're storing these things as blobs, believe it or not. They, we have, do I have another one? Yeah, okay, cool, here. Uh, we have these uh, things, uh, pretty complex uh, uh, data structures of, of uh, nested attributes. They are really documents, more or less, in their uh, nature. So it would have been really hard to try to hammer this thing into a column family that made any kind of sense, right? So. Maybe maybe some of them would would have made sense to do, but it would just take too much time to to try to uh, to uh, determine which ones were made sense and which one didn't make sense to have as actual uh, columns. So what we did was we picked out uh, the relevant things like the ID, of course, and maybe an update timestamp or something like that, and perhaps what 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 type is it that goes in this blob, so we can easily serialize it back. Um, and then the blob itself. This, this we also had a funny debate the other day about what, 
what's good and what's bad about schema evolution. This thing at least gave us, uh, it, it's not an entry into that debate. I like schemas, <laughs> like schema validation even more. But, but uh, in this case, there was just too much work to do it and it, it was very easy to, to store a blob in, in the database. The downside is of course that searching, filtering, these things are really hard. Uh, it's not, not like you can just uh, fire off a query and have that thing search through your database on the fly, uh, which, which is not really a problem because that's not supported by Scylla anyway, currently. Uh, here's the hoping, guys. The simpler data types like loggings and events, those were modeled uh, properly with uh, uh, whatever they needed in terms of uh, text uh, fields for, for messages, types, when they happened, uh, why they happened, etc. cetera, um, where, what, what thing was wrong, what thing was right, all of these things. So that was more uh, properly done. So, uh, what stuff do we use for this thing? Well, well of course, well, Scylla. That's the, uh, uh, and I would say this one, given, given what, uh, what I heard before, this is a small install, uh, which doesn't ma affect us at all, I would say. It's super fast, and uh, the uh, read latency uh, uh, is very good, and the write laten latency is, as usual, crazy. So, uh, uh, and uh, we would really like the Prometheus support to land at some point uh, because we visualize most our other things in using that. But basically this is uh, what it does and it has, uh, and what does it for us? And it uh, uh, runs uh, in, uh, currently all data uh, resides in the same instances. They're in different scheme, uh, key spaces. Uh, so as to allow for for easy migration, uh, easier anyway. So, and uh, like Pekka uh, noted during lunch, I'm the crazy guy who just upgrades all the instance it happens. Uh, that hasn't been any problem at all, but uh, I'm fully expecting there to at some point be uh, problems. So we're, we are ma properly making these snapshots every time just to be safe. But uh, so far, only between 1.0 and 1.1 has ever been any work. There was some, I'm not sure exactly, I don't remember, but there was more work between 1.0 and 1.1. The other ones have just been seamlessly, you replace the repo file and you go through a couple of steps and you're done. Sometimes it can, it can take a while to drain the nodes, but fine. NATS is running on even smaller machines and has no problem catching up. Uh, it has, we have some abnormally large entities that needed to be accounted for, which uh, is an easy setting in, in NATS. You can allow it or you can uh, just ignore it because it will just drop them for you <laughs> silently, I might add. But uh, uh, once you find them, you can, you can tune it. We use request reply pattern mostly. Uh, th this is something that supports and it's very neat if you need to ensure that any one of the possible connected uh, uh, downstream uh, services need to have taken this message. It's a good thing to get some sort of reliability on top of a, uh, an otherwise very stateless uh, function. Uh, oh, this one, yeah. Because we uh, used to use uh, Kafka and it, that's a persistent messaging. Nuts isn't at all. And we don't think that we will need it, at least not yet. But if we do, we will uh, keep, keep an eye on not streaming. And uh, to me, not streaming seems to be to Kafka what it lies to Cassandra. That uh, uh, it's lower level and it's approximately 10 times faster. But like I said, let's not do it now because we don't really need it at the moment. Apps are written in Go. Use uh, the excellent GoSQL uh, library for, for Scylla communication and uh, we have had actually very good experiences so far with it. No problem whatsoever in terms of that. And uh, what we use mostly is, like I mentioned before, some of the apps have very uh, 
several interactions with uh, external systems. So we use uh, the concurrency support in Go uh, heavily to, uh, to alleviate that sort of thing. We are, we are basically at uh, the latency of the slowest uh, uh, response currently, which is as good as it's going to get unless we have to uh, do something, something uh, completely different, of course. So uh, why go? Why not? So I was tired. I was uh, I was a bit tired of the of the JVM. I have done it for so long, and while it's a very good platform, it's it's mostly refreshing to try something new. So, uh, and these are the ones. And uh, whenever you pick a build tool for Go, this is the one you should have. At least I like it. So that's it, guys. Welcome. <laughs>